didn't know today would be your last Or that I'd have to say goodbye to you so fast I'm so numb I can't feel anymore I'm praying you just walk back through that door and tell me that I was only dreaming You're not really gone as long as I believe There will be another angel Around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside of me And I will hold on tight not my place to question only God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight always made my troubles feel so small And you were always there to catch me when I'd fall In a world where heroes come and go Well, God just took the only one I know So I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day When I see your face again But until then God must need another angel Around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside now we'll hold on tight It's not my place to question Only God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels Around the throne tonight Singing hallelujah Didn't know today would be our last Or that I'd have to say goodbye to you so fast I'm so numb I can't feel anymore I'm praying you just walk back through that door and tell me that I was only dreaming You're not really gone as long as I believe There will be another angel Around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside of me And I will hold on tight it's not my place to question Only 
God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight Always made my troubles feel so small you were always there to catch me when I'd fall In a world where heroes come and go Where God just took the only one I know So I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day when I see your face again But until then, God must need another angel around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside of me and I will hold on tight not my place to question Only God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels Around the throne tonight Singing hallelujah Hallelujah Just jealous of the angels around the throne Didn't know today would be our last Or that I'd have to say goodbye to you so fast I'm so numb I can't feel anymore I'm praying you just walk back through that door and tell me that I was only dreaming You're not really gone as long as I believe There will be another angel Around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside of me And I will hold on tight not my place to question Only God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels Around the throne tonight Always made my Troubles feel so small And you were always there to catch me When I'd fall In a world where heroes come and go Where God just took the only one I know So I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day When I 
see your face again but until then god must need another angel around the throne tonight your love lives on inside of me and now we'll hold on tight it's not my place to question only God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels Around the throne tonight Singing hallelujah 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 Around the throne Troubles come and my heart burdened me. Then I am still and wait here in silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me. Will the congregation please stand? You raise me up, I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who 
believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. The hour is coming and now is when the dead would hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Our Savior Jesus Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Because I live, you will live also and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the first things are passed away. We lift our voices as we join together. We sing the hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father. Faithfulness, morning by morning. 
Amen. Please be seated as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O Lord, our God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you give to your troubled children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, and by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sisters, brothers, those of us who are gathered here in the chapel at Tranquility Methodist Church, and those who are joining us via the multimedia, we are met in this solemn moment to commend Victoria Carrington into the hands of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father who sent his son Jesus Christ to be our redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed, and in whose name alone we have salvation. Today, as we celebrate the life of our dear departed sister Victoria, I invite the family member to come forward and to share with us the eulogy. and family, our sister Victoria was born in Bethel, Tobago on November 20th, 1933. She departed this life on the morning of Wednesday, 23rd March, 2022. She did not like the name Victoria and preferred to be called Vicky, allowing us at home to be even more brief and call her Vic. Her formal education was at Tranquility Girls Intermediate School, as it was then known, at a private institution offering what was then called commercial subjects, and eventually a program in public administration at the University of the West Indies Mona campus in Jamaica. More important was her self-education through her entire life. She was a voracious reader, consuming anything she could lay her hands on. In the days of the public library at Knox Street, she would arrive home with armloads of books. It only took her a few days before she had to replenish the stock to take her into the beginning of the next week. She frequently gave books as gifts. When she gave you a book, she had read it and expected intelligent commentary and discussion as part of your thanks. You would not know she had read it until you commented on the contents. She developed a technique of reading a book without breaking the back, as we used to say. She would lie on her side in bed, fractionally open the pages and peep into the text, rapidly reading from cover to cover before placing the book at the bottom of a weighty pile, eventually wrapping it in pristine condition for the recipient. She once gave me a three-volume illustrated Bible dictionary and apologized for not getting through the whole of it. In her working life, Vic was an exemplary public servant, affable, conscientious, efficient, and incorruptible. 
In the 1950s, she began at the level of temporary second class clerk in the Motor Vehicle Licensing Office on Wrightson Road. As the junior in the office, one of her daily assigned tasks was to walk from licensing to the Treasury Building on what was then Marine Square, carrying a briefcase with the day's taking of fees for deposit in the Treasury. Protection and security were provided by a robust policeman accompanying her with a baton and a paper bag containing a big stone. He never had to use the big stone, fortunately for both of them. Her public service career took her through several ministries, including those responsible for education, agriculture, home affairs, works, and national security. She was frequently seconded to other departments when they needed her skills. The Prices Commission was one such instance. Her last assignment before retirement was as Permanent Secretary in National Security. By that time, a big stone in a paper bag had been replaced by very different hardware. Vic was a no-nonsense worker. It is told by some of her colleagues that on one occasion early in her career at Home Affairs, she was assigned to a desk that was previously managed by a man whose favorite daily patrol was to walk around, walk around the office with stacks of files under his arm, hoping to convey an impression of importance significantly above his rank. His in-dip, out-dip, pending dip, and other wells on his desk were chock full of manila folders. Vic was assigned to take over his desk. To the shock of her colleagues, by the end of her first day, there were no folders on the desk. She had worked through the piles. That sort of purposeful work characterized her stewardship. The challenge of getting things done effectively was her delight. In several of her work settings, her articulateness, breadth of knowledge, efficiency, foresight, and presence of mind led to her being assigned to conference duties with visiting delegations from other countries. One such occasion brought her a letter of commendation from the then Prime Minister of our country. On the 26th of October 1972, Dr. the Honorable Eric Williams wrote in part as follows. Dear Ms. Carrington, I write to thank you both on my behalf and on behalf of the government for the excellent service you have rendered on the occasion of the recent Heads of Governments Conference. As you know, many heads of governments expressed their appreciation in public. All of them spoke to me privately in the highest terms of the quality of our liaison officers as well as our liaison aides. In these days, when the public servant is so often under attack for discourtesy and untidiness, it was a real pleasure for me as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago to see the efficiency, politeness, and neatness of some of our public servants. I wish you all success in your future career as a public servant." End of quote. Vic's performance in that context was normal for her. No occasion could overwhelm her. The more demanding the task, the more the competence it evoked from her. When I read Dr. Williams' letter, which came to my attention only within the last few days, I was amused by his comment on neatness. Clearly, he had limited exposure to Vic, because he would have been obliged to have been more expansive. Vic was a dresser. Taste in clothes, her exact requirements of precision from her dressmakers and her milliner, as well as her careful selection of what was best for each event made her a fashionista before the word was trending. Appreciation of her wardrobe and her personal carriage to match her outfits drew appreciative comments from both friends and strangers. On one occasion as she walked down Frederick Street, a casual limer was heard to exclaim, 
Boy, she walking down the road as if she hearing applause of interest in our mother's latter years, Vic ensured that mummy was as well dressed as she was. Mummy died 14 years ago at age 94, and there was no way that if you saw her out on an occasion, you would assign her as many decades as she had lived. The commitment to excellence that characterized Vic was not limited to showy exteriors. It shaped the quality of the care that she offered to our mother in the closing years of her life. She set a good table, frequently including her offerings of wine that she had made herself from every imaginable local fruit. She did not just make the wines, but labeled them with more than just the name of the fruit that she had used. Pink Delight, Maraval, Lanyap among those that jumped to mind. She had a preference for gourmet cooking, the special occasion catering, but she also made run-of-the-mill food taste as if it weren't. Her condiments, including pepper jelly and chow chow, were famous. For many years, her birthday celebrations would draw out the best of her efforts. She did not invite anyone to her birthday celebrations she would state categorically that those per persons who knew that it was her birthday and who loved her would come. And so the house overflowed with long-standing friends, newbies, family, and neighbors. The carnival season was a special time of year for her. It encouraged liming without explanation. She started fetting and liming from the days of Sel Duncan and continued for many, many years. When she played mass, she eschewed skimpy and opted for lightweight mobility. Our home was close to the action, within easy reach of Casablanca and Renegades, a short stretch to All Stars, not far from Saldina, Ken Morris, Jason Griffith, Edmund Hart, and the home team. Remember, this was before the Poisonous Tribe, if you will excuse my compression. So our home became Carnival Central for friends, family, visitors, and even some lost strays. Pit stop, rehydration center, a plate of pillow, and near enough to the Memorial Park that you could rejoin your band before it hit the stage. Vic managed the confusion and contributed to the hilarity that accompanied the season. Of interest, Liming revealed a paradox in her personality. Although she was fiercely independent in her thoughts and decision making, she always preferred to move with her own person. Vic had a way with words. <clears throat> her sense of humor remained keen throughout her life. Her wit had a sharp edge, and her mammogism was smooth and subtle. Her humor was backed by a strong sense of narrative. This was not a latter-day development. When Trevor and I were boys, she would hold us captivated with long tales based on her shaggy dog style, which would end all of a sudden with a totally incongruous finale, throwing us into howls of laughter. On that base, she built her manipulation of humor which one could appreciate well in the letters she wrote when any of us was away from Trinidad and in her more recent email messages from her iPad. In her youth, she frequented the Little Caribbean Theater and actually did some dancing with Beryl McBurney. I can't say whether she appeared on stage in a public performance. If she did, it might have been in a cast of thousands but she certainly went through the movements and limbered her body at White Street. The rest of her unrecorded talents included singing, starting with Bingle Bangle Bongle, I Don't Want to Leave the Congo, and fading out in more contemporary times with more politically correct lyrics. In closing, I repeat here one of her favorite quotes from Shakespeare's Hamlet, Act three, scene one, on the subject of death. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, 
there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. May her soul rest in perpetual peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive synopsis of the life of our dear departed sister, Sister Vicky. We continue to worship. We turn our focus now to the ministry of the written word. We invite our readers, uh, Brother Roger Carrington and Sister Roslyn Carrington, to lead us first in the reading of the psalm, followed by the Old Testament reading. Okay. I apologize, I thought it would have been um, bookmarked. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. Is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it's now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. was a time when I knew all the um, the books in order by heart, but I think that's that's probably past. <laughs> Then 
the funny thing is, it's one of my favorite passages as well. All right, so I'm reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time to war, and a time for, for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and to enjoy themselves as long as they live. Thank you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We thank both our readers for leading us in the reading of the psalm and the Old Testament lesson from Ecclesiastes, respectively. Let us all now rise again as we lift our voices. We sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. <coughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, my Savior. All the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture burst on my sight, angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. Ah, in my Savior I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Please remain standing as we receive the gospel. Our gospel reading comes to us from the gospel according to St. John, Chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 1 through to verse 6 and verse 27 inclusive. Glory to you, O God. Thus begins the first verse of the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. I read, Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of Christ. Praise be to Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of the Methodist community to extend my sincere condolences to the family, friends, and relatives of our dear departed sister Vicky. I pray that at this time, this time of grief and bereavement, that God may truly minister to you through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving you the comfort and the strength that you need in order to persevere through this time of grief and bereavement. May God truly bless, guide, and keep you all. I share a brief meditation based on the gospel and the scripture passages that were shared this morning. Times and seasons out of the depths of my heart, Psalm 130, and the gospel according to St. John chapter 14, 1 to 6, and at verse 27. We focus on the verse where Jesus made a very powerful affirmation when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very powerful words of affirmation. And when speaking with the family, they mentioned to me of Vicky's sense of humor of her very methodical and very dedicated way in which she does everything. So in this meditation, I want to use a story. For some, it may seem humorous, but it's not necessarily humorous because it carries a very significant and important message. And it sort of ties in very well with the gospel reading when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this is a story that was told by an evangelist many years ago, some two, three hundred years ago, by the name of Harry Ironside. And when he would go and preach, especially to a congregation or a crowd of people that he, has, he is meeting for the first time, he usually opens with this story. Because remember, the work of an evangelist is to point others to Christ. And so he said, there was this jester. Today we will know that person as a joker or a comedian. And he had the privilege of working for the king a king who ruled over a very vast empire. And you know that even if you are ruling over a small empire, it will pose many challenges, and many difficulties, and sometimes you can become a bit frustrated, despondent, and you would want to break the monotony, change the atmosphere, and think of something light so that 
you can compose yourself before you re-engage in the activities that you are about to do. So the king ruled over this vast empire. And many a times he became very much downtrodden, very much depressed, very much wanting to give up. And whenever he felt down, he will send for the jester to come and to perform for him to lift his spirits. So he sent for the jester. And the jester came and he performed for the king. And the king applauded him for his, his performance because with his performance, he was able to lift the spirits of the king so much so that the king can now face his challenges, feeling revived and revitalized and with a calm sense of mind. And to show his appreciation, the king called the jester to his throne and he said to him, O oh, jester, I believe that you are the most foolish person that I have ever met. And here, I want to give you my scepter. And I want for you to do something for me. If you should ever find anyone more foolish than yourself, I want you to pass that scepter onto them. So the jester accepted it with grace. And then he took it home and have it placed in a very prominent part in his home so that he can be reminded of his performance with the king and how much the king appreciated it. So it remained there. Many years went by and the king became seriously ill, so much so to the point of death. His physicians who attended to him did all that they could in order to make him well or make him better. But they had to confess to the king that with all the knowledge and the skill that they had, they would not be able to make him better. And from their prognosis, he is going to die very soon. And of course, such news would bring the king to a point where he would again feel depressed. He will feel despondent and he would feel very low. And he said to himself, I don't mind dying, but I do not want to die in this sad, morbid state. He decided that he is going to send for the jester to perform for him for the final time so that he can lift his spirits before he died. And so he summoned the jester, and the jester came. This time he came into the palace, and there he performed for the king, not knowing that it would have been the last time he was doing so. And again, he was able to lift the spirit of the king so that the king felt much better, and he was willing to face his fate in a very calm, calm way. So, after the jester had performed for the king, for the second time in his life, the king called the jester to his bedside. And then he spoke to him once again, saying these words, O oh, jester, I thank you for the many occasions when you performed for me and you were able to lift my spirits so that I can face my challenges with a new sense of vigor and a new sense of vibrancy. And I thank you for coming on this occasion and performing for me and being successful in doing the same. But Jester, I'm afraid that this would be the last occasion where you are able to perform for me. You see, O oh Jester, I am going on a journey from which I shall never return and I do not know what to expect when I get there. Let me repeat that. I am going on a journey from which I shall never return and I do not know what to expect when I get there. And as the jester pondered on the words of the king, 
For the very first time, he responded verbally to the king, and he said to him, O oh, king, thank you for allowing me the privilege to perform for you, and for me, in my skill, being able to lift your spirits. But, O oh, king, can you remember some years ago, when I performed for you and you called me to your throne, and you said to me, when you handed me your scepter, you said to me that if I should ever find anyone more foolish than myself, that I should pass that scepter onto them? Well, here, O oh king, is the scepter. For you are telling me, O oh king, that you are going on a journey from which you shall never return, and you do not know what to expect when you get there. Obviously, in this story, the jester had considered not only the times and season for the life here on earth, but he would have also made provision for the life that is to come. So for him, anyone who is alive and living, who makes every preparation for life here on earth, and makes no preparation for death and its after effects, he, to his mind, that person must be more foolish than himself. The king, he would have known from his very lifestyle, from his very position, that he should make every necessary preparation. As a king, whenever he would have to visit another domain or any part of his domain which he ruled over, he will always send an entourage ahead of him. And his entourage will ensure that everything is in place so that when the king arrives, he will know what to expect and he will be treated in the way that he deserved. He did that in his earthly life. But he made no preparation for what happens after death. Hence, in the gospel reading, Jesus' purpose for coming here on earth, after we as human beings were subjected to the penalty of sin, which resulted in death, he came to deliver us from such a faith, so that even when death comes, we will know where we are going, and we will know what to expect when we get there. Hence, in the gospel, he is speaking to his disciples. And again, they are concerned. His disciples were concerned because, first, he was arrested, he was killed, and he was laid in the tomb, and they thought that it was all over. For the three and a half years they had followed him, they thought it came to nothing. Now that their master is dead, what are they going to do? But when they received the news that he rose triumphantly from the dead, as he told them, and he had to spend many days trying to convince them that it was actually he, Jesus Christ, the same one who was with them all the time, who died and was buried, is now alive and is alive forevermore. And now he is saying to them, I have to leave you. I am going to my Father, and I am going there to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. He said this to them, and Thomas was the one who stood up and asked the question, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And it is with that question that Jesus answered, in this powerful affirmation. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our dear sister Vicky was very meticulous in everything that she did. If we reflect on the eulogy that our brother shared, you will 
I've heard how she would put things in place step by step, stage by stage, one after the other, so that she can be very efficient in whatever she did. Whether it is the work that she did, whether it is the clothes that she wore for the week, she will lay out what she's going to be wearing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. She was very meticulous and very much conscious of what she was doing. And the thing is, she did it not only for life here on earth, but she also had eternity in mind. She knew that death would come someday. She did not know when, but she knew that when death comes, where she wanted to be and what she wanted to expect when she got there. So in all of her doing, she made sure that Jesus Christ was her Lord and Savior and that she loved him and that the very life that she lived, how efficient she was in everything that she did was a reflection of the love of God that was within her. Thus, we can truthfully say we know where Vicky is going and we know that she knows what to expect when she gets there. But the message today is not for Vicky. Her sojourn here on earth has come to an end. She has stepped out of time and into eternity. And there is no coming back. But we who are alive and well, we who are still in the land of the living, who are still journeying in this vessel called life, what about us? Can we say, if death should come to us at this moment, or very soon, can we say truthfully and with confidence, as the hymn writer said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine? Can we say that with conviction and assurity that when death comes to us, we would know where we are going and we will know what to expect when we get there. And if it is we cannot answer with conviction that indeed we know where we are going and we know, we, we know where we are going and we know what to expect when we get there, if we cannot answer that question convincingly, then we are in a state of indecision. We are in a place where we are neither here nor there. And the God whom we serve, the God who created the heavens and the earth, calls upon us while we live to make that decision. And when we make that decision, he then confirms to us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are his children. His spirit speaks to our spirit and it confirms within us that indeed we are children of the living God so that we would know where we are going and we would know what to expect when we get there. The scepter that the king passed on represents indecision, not making a choice, but just simply living life as it goes by, not considering not only the present time that is before us, but the life that is to come after death. If we do not make the necessary preparation, if we do not make the necessary requirements, we would not know where we are going and we would not know what to expect when we get there. And chances are, we may, we may not find ourselves in the presence of God when death comes to us. Today, as we say farewell to our beloved dear sister Vicky, let us reflect on our own lives, our own mortality, knowing that someday we too will have to journey after her. And as we journey after her, may we take a page or a chapter out of a book 
and live life in such a way that it reflects the Christ in us and that we would make every necessary preparation by first acknowledging and accepting Jesus Christ as the Son of God and our Savior and the Savior of the world and live in such a way that the life that we live will reflect the very character and nature of Jesus Christ. Only then we can follow him in the way that he has gone. In the tomb, through the tomb, into eternal life, in the presence of God. Only then can we have that conviction and that assurance that we are heirs of children of God and that we can live in his presence, not only in our sojourn here on earth, but for an eternity that is yet to come. May God grant us the grace that we, if we have not yet made that decision, we can do it even now, this very moment, because in this unpredictable life that we live, even though we hope for the future, what we have is a present here and now. And if we make that decision now, then it can prepare us for the future that is to come. So today, if you hear the voice of God speaking to you, harden not your heart. Come to know Jesus Christ and to know him in his resurrection power. Receive him as your Lord and Savior and allow him to give to you the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will become within you a spring of living water, confirming you as his children, and thus heirs of his salvation, that when the time comes for you to depart from this earth, you would know where you are going, and you would know what to expect when you get there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand at this moment as we reaffirm our faith in the God whom we know and love, as together we recite the words of the Apostles' Creed. For those who do not know it by heart, it is printed in the leaflet in the order of service. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our Lord and our God, who have overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers and are now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit God, our Comforter, who bear witness within us of our acceptance with the Father and have become the pledge of our eternal inheritance. All praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We bless your name for the life of Victoria, whom we today lay to rest. 
We give you thanks for the joy and the blessing her life has brought to others, for her service to her generation according to your will, and for every happy remembrance of her life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness, which have followed her all the days of her life. But now the trials of this world are over, and death itself is past. Receive her into your perfect kingdom, and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We rise as we lift our voices once again. We sing the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, that angels prostrate fall. During the singing of this hymn, an offertory for the work of God will be received. <coughs> Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you have extended to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the love you have for us, in so much that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our stead, that through his death we may have life and have it in all of its fullness. With such a great outpouring of love towards us, we respond in kind. We give not only of these monetary gifts which have been given, but with it, we give of ourselves, our time, our talents, praying that both the gift and the giver may be used for the building up and the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth, that others may come to know Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. These mercies we pray and ask through no other name, but in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the true and the living God, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Please remain standing for the commendation. Eternal God, 
who have made us all and hate nothing that you have made, and have given your Son, Jesus Christ, for our redemption, we command our dear sister Vicky to your perfect mercy and wisdom. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. He opened his mouth, he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue in a brief moment of prayer, and then we sing the closing hymn. Let us pray. O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, raise us up, we pray, from death of sin to a new life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we shall be found acceptable in your sight. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Grant to the bereaved consolation and faith in this time of distress and trial the blessed hope in the coming of your kingdom, the sustaining grace in the fellowship of your people, and the steadfastness in the service of your name and the doing of your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray especially for the family of our dear departed sister Vicky, praying that indeed you will comfort them in this time of their grief and bereavement, that you will grant them the strength that they may persevere and overcome. We pray that you will bind them with cords of love that cannot be broken, that they may support and strengthen each other. So as they go through this time of grief and bereavement, they would not be overcome, and they would not go through as those who do not believe. But even in the midst of it, they can sense and feel your presence and be strengthened and be guided thereby so that they may persevere and overcome. Bless and keep them, we pray, in Jesus' name. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life. Until the shadows lengthen, the evening comes. The busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant unto us safe lodging, holy rest, and peace at the last, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. After our closing hymn, I will pronounce the benediction, and thereafter I would lead the recession. There would be no viewing after the service, and uh, we will go straight to the funeral home. At least the body will go straight to the funeral home, where later this evening, the family would gather for the committal and final cremation at the Tagarigua Bell Grove crematorium. We rise, we lift our voices, we sing that hymn of assurance, will your anchor hold in the storms of life. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or foam remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Ascend to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Will your anchor hold in the streets of fear when the clock is raw and the reef is near? While the surges rave and the wild wind blows, will the angry wave then your boat afloat? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot.
wonderful man deep in the Savior's blood. Will your anchor hold in the floods of death when the waters cold chill your latest breath? On the rising tide you can never fail when your anchor holds within the veil. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Ascend to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the Savior's blood. Will your eyes behold through the morning light the city of gold and the harbor bright when your anchor safe by the heavenly shore when life's storms are past forevermore we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll Ascend to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Mm. Amen. Please receive the benediction. And now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing as I lead the recessional. I will go ahead, the casket following directly behind me, and then the family members beginning with the Paul bearers and other family members thereafter. As we do that, we sing the hymn, I am singing on my way to the Lord.
troubles come and my heart burdened be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me more than I can.